So there are a couple of things I want to talk about today. With Jesus, he is he's entering into Jerusalem and he knows um, the things that are going to happen there and he's aware of people's fickleness. And there are all these people who want to follow him. Sorta. Kinda. And the apostles are confused about how to do that. Should we just, you know, if they disagree with us, kill them all? And Jesus is like, <laughs> and we'll, but what they what they want to know is how do we go on? How do we go on with you, right? And there's some of that in Galatians as well. So Paul tells us that that we're called to freedom and to to be and do all of the things that freedom gives us, um, but that doesn't mean self indulgence as a freedom. It doesn't mean that we, and, and here, I think there's some misunderstanding that's happened with this passage about the flesh and the spirit, right? So there's this split in Western civilization between mind and body. And we've assumed, I think, that this reading feeds into that, and we've allowed that to, to feed into that, to assume that flesh is one thing and spirit is another, and there the twain shall meet. And I don't really think that's what Paul's saying. What Paul is saying is, you have a human nature that tends to want to go do things for your own good and, you know, everybody else be damned. And that's not how God works. That's not how spirit works. That's not how Jesus works. And so when we're following that spirit of Christ, then regardless of what we want in our humanness, right, that we don't indulge that. We instead follow peace and and togetherness and those kinds of things. And I think the question for us this week, especially that as I've been contemplating how do we even address Orlando, is how do you go on? What do you do? And I want to suggest that there are some things that we can do, and one of them not everybody will agree with, and that's okay, but I want to suggest that one of the things that we do to address Orlando is to get angry. There are all these kinds of memes on Facebook that say, you know, we don't want to meet violence with violence. I agree with that. We certainly don't want to meet hate with hate. But anger doesn't mean hatred. Mm -hmm. All right? So there's a piece in the passage here from, from Galatians where in that list of things we're not to do, idolatry and drunkenness and licentiousness, is anger, right? And yet, hasn't God gotten angry? Mm -hmm. Read the Old Testament. Problem is hacked off a lot. <laughs> Mostly at the Israelites. Right? Mm -hmm. Think about Jesus in the temple. Tossing the tables around. He was not having a happy pin out a moment when he did that. He was hacked off. Because people were abusing the temple of God for things of the flesh. Right. For greed. Right? Jesus was angry. And I think it's okay for us to be angry. You know, there's all these medical studies, and, and, and this was a big deal back in the, wow, like, 90s, I think, is when it was. There was all this research about being angry and what that does to your body, and all the stress that puts on it. It's true, it does. Suppressed anger does that. Letting anger out is not what causes that. Because what I want to suggest to you is that there is such a thing as righteous and holy anger. I am angry that somebody took the lives of 49 of my brothers and sisters and put another 53 in the hospital. I'm angry that that happened. I am angry that, you know, today we celebrate a year of marriage equality in this country. And there was a part of us, for people of my age, who were like, wow, this is so cool that this happened and life is different now. And yet we remembered all of the things that happened before. And Orlando went, Pip. we can't quite celebrate yet. Because we may have the freedom to marry, but we don't have freedom from violence. We don't have freedom from hatred. We don't have freedom from those things that we sometimes thought we did. And I think it's okay to be angry about that. The key to being angry about something is not to stay stuck in the anger. Because anger that just is like a dog chasing its tail serves no purpose. Being angry for, angry for anger's sake is purposeless. But when we can use that anger to motivate us, <clears throat> when we can use that anger to motivate us to get rid of crazy gun laws that allow anybody to own a military assault rifle, 
That's a good anger. And I'm not talking about taking away your best parents. My daddy's got parents. I grew up with them. It's a difference. Big difference. There's a big difference between hunting a deer and hunting someone who is deer. So. The military itself has, in fact, come out with a statement that says, these guns should not be in the hands of civilians. And we clearly know why that is. Because they're intended to kill people. And that's all they're intended for. Yeah. So when we use our anger to change policies, to motivate people, to go to the ballot box and vote for those people who will do those things that we've asked them to do, to bring peace, to bring those gifts of the Spirit to our country. That's a good anger. It's a righteous anger, and I believe it's a holy anger. So one of the ways I want to suggest that we move forward from Orlando is to be good and ticked off. We have a right to our anger. And I think when people tell us, you need to be peaceful, you need to be calm, it's another way of stealing from us the reality that we lost people that we loved. Mm -hmm. Whether we knew them or not, they were us. So I think it's okay to be anger, but we don't stay stuck in that anger. And the reason that we don't stay stuck in that anger is the second thing I want to talk about, and that the way that we move forward is together. We allow ourselves to be angry and be motivated by the anger to work together from that anger. But a cool thing happens. When we're doing what we're supposed to do with our anger, with that righteous, holy anger, and we're doing that together, not only do we accomplish things, but the anger morphs. The anger changes. It changes us individually, and it changes us as a people because now we are drawn together. We are drawn together in common, holy cause. When we come together as a community and we stand up and say to those people who have offered thoughts and prayers while voting against us, we can change things. We can put pressure where pressure is due on politicians and on policies. When we come together as community, we heal one another because we remind each other that this horrible thing that happened should be addressed, should be acknowledged. And yet we come together in a new way, determined to be together, to stand together, and to hold one another in comfort in our grief. There are amazing things that happen, you know. I don't think God ever intends for anything like Orlando to happen, ever. That is not God's will. Don't let anybody tell you it is. It is not God's will. But Romans tells us that God will work through all those circumstances. God will work in us and through us to bring out of that tragedy something good. Not because the tragedy was meant to happen but that our response to it, how we go forward in it, is to find one another, to cling to one another, to lift up one another in the midst of that circumstance. And that strengthens our relationships and our community. And finally, I want to suggest that the other way that we move forward through this, and Paul alludes to this, because Paul, Paul's talking about the fruits of the Spirit, right? That peace and that joy and those things that we do when we give in to God, right? 